Today, every business is a digital business. Most of us are migrating workloads to the cloud, adopting DevOps tools, rolling out RPA software, and supporting a remote workforce. While opportunity is great, so is the risk of advanced cyber attacks. Many high-profile breaches start with a compromise of privileged credentials. CyberArk is the number one leader in privileged access management. Talk to CyberArk today to secure privileged access for humans and machines across hybrid and cloud environments and on endpoints. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash CyberArk and stay one step ahead of the attackers. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome back, everyone, to Enterprise Security Weekly. Join us at InfoSec World 2020, June 22nd through the 24th at Disney's Coronado Springs Resort. Uh, all systems go for this conference. Uh, 15% off is what the listeners save on an InfoSec World main conference or world pass. Securityweekly.com forward slash ISW 2020. Uh, we'll get you there and the discount. Uh, Wim Reams is here with us. Wim is an experienced security professional. He's been in the community uh, for some time. I won't date him by <laughs> saying he's been around forever. But ever since I can remember being in the security community, Wim's been around. Uh, he's worked at Rapid7, IO Active, Ernst & Young. And today you have your own firm. Is that correct, Wim? That's 100% correct, yes. Yes. Uh, and doing a lot of virtual CISO work uh, and consulting for firms in uh, yep. security. Well, it's nice to have you on the show. Well, and I, th thanks for having me. Um, we wanted to talk today, Wim, about building an information security team. I, the question that you posed I thought was very interesting and kind of branches off some uh, other conversations we've been having this week. And that question is, is information security a specialization of IT or a branch of its own? Right. And what's the answer there? <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I, I uh, think it's different I, I in every organization, you. but I'm curious to hear I think your so thoughts. Too. Go ahead. Yeah. Wimmer Matt, it doesn't matter. Well, I mean, it, I, I mean, if I think about the evolution, it, look, I I started in in '96 in the security space before this was a hot topic, right? And it was kind of came out of the IT group, and we had this kind of specialization skill to not only understand how IT was deployed, but also how to secure it. I think, and, and Wim, this is where I, I'd love your take on this. I think in order for security to get adopted, it evolved into its own thing, but I'm not sure that it needed to. Because um, when I think about the way we've approached security over the past 20 plus years, is it's always kind of been like this afterthought. It's always kind of been at the end of a project or end of a release or something like that. And I think if we really want security embedded in our systems, in our applications, it actually needs to be part of the other components of the company, not mm -hmm. its own separate thing. That's just my take on kind of the evolution and, and where it may need to go. Yeah, I think I um, I agree 100% with that. Um, may, maybe instead of going into the history, like, let's look at uh, today, right? Uh, a lot of companies, a lot of uh, software security companies are pushing the uh, what they call the shift left um, parad paradigm or whatever they want to call it. Um, and I've been working with uh, both uh, software development companies and um, pr product development companies, hardware uh, development companies, primarily in the in the medical space. And if you map out the processes that you have to implement security in, it doesn't look like a right to left, and it doesn't even look like security is done on the right right now. It looks like uh, if you implement security in such a process, uh, it looks like a carpet bomb. Security is everywhere. And that's the, the, the key thing that I, I, I want to stress as well. Uh, I, everybody knows that I've been involved in IC Squared uh, for a long time, um, certifying security professionals. And if you look at how organizations are uh, working right now, I work on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with product managers, with, um, 
leaders of uh, of, of of departments, um, but also with uh, with engineers uh, and with uh, C level executives, and they all need to understand security in some way. So we don't need more security professionals. We need more professionals with very broad skills uh, that also understand security, right? And that's that's where I want to see security go, not not being a specialization, but something that is part of of the whole. Yeah, and I I thought Gerald, um, the CISO for Log Me In, just described exactly that that process, right? He has a security champions program where there's folks who get training uh, in regular meetings that are focused on security in all the different teams from product to IT to operations. And I, I think that's how you get security done today because the uh, threat landscape and your attack surface is just so great today. Uh, yes, that would, the only thing I miss, and I obviously don't know how uh, uh, Jared Im, uh, implemented it, and he, he definitely sounded like a very smart man that has done a lot of things right uh, at the company that he's at. Uh, one thing that I often miss in the concept of a security champion is ownership. Yeah, it's that's a good point. Uh, it's a bit informal. It's a bit um, give me what you can give. Uh, but what geeks really uh, love, and there, there we circle back to um, how do you build a, a security team, uh, they really want to be um, the owners of the solution, right? If you have skilled geeks, uh, and for instance, most, most of the developers are, are very skilled people. Um, I, I've never come across the, the dumb developer that uh, is the prototype in, our, uh, in, in the security community, right? It's always the developers that are doing things wrong. Um, giving them ownership and just giving them the tools to uh, to do what they need to do uh, helps a lot, uh, and and I think that's where the the click is between being a security champion and being engaged in security, but not really owning the delivery of it, or really owning security and um, and adding value. That that's where the the click is for me. Yeah, it's that convergence that that gets us there, right? It's security is not that external entity that's trying to have any influence or control. You want to put security into the people that have that control over what goes into that software and what doesn't, right? Yeah, yeah. I I, I can give a very simple exam uh, example. Uh, I I give uh, threat modeling training to uh, development teams. So I step into a room. I have about half a day of uh, of theory. And after that, I don't have any set exercises. I don't do um, things that I've prepared. I just ask them, what are you working on right now? And we're going to start modeling that, right? And the way you see them adopting the theory that you've given in that, uh, in that half day and immediately start applying that to their, um, to their own products and see, see, seeing them create narratives towards uh, product management on, on how security is important to deliver customer value, uh, that's where... I really see security work. It, is it? I think it's more important than ever to have security as part of that because when we talk about you know building a team that is delivering a product, it's becoming a differentiator in the market. So uh, hiring and info, building a team inside of your existing teams and a separate team I, is it more important than ever before? Uh, I. I, I think it is. Um, there, there needs to be a focus on security and building that into your teams, allowing them, uh, allowing, allowing them to, um, to absorb that, that uh, information, to, to get knowledge uh, and to apply that uh, in a rapid manner uh, is super important, yes. You had a note in there, Wim, about um, hiring and firing. How do you, how do you manage the, you know, if this person is in security, maybe they want to go to development, maybe development from security, but then what if there is no path uh, for them? How do you manage the dynamics uh, of your various teams when it comes to uh, enterprise information security? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's a, that's a very, very interesting dynamic because uh, obviously I, I work as a virtual CISO. Uh, I, I get to... Um, Play with the with the deck that is dealt to, dealt to me, mm -hmm. so uh, I don't have a lot of choice of which resources I um, I get on a team, and it's often that way as well that I identify people within operations or within support that have a feeling for security, and I try to pull them in, right, uh, and then their their management doesn't see it that way, uh, and they say like, okay, this person needs to uh, stay in support or this person needs to be 
uh, in administration, you cannot have them uh, even part time on security. Uh, and then three months la later, you see those people leave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that just sucks because it's apparently those managers think that um, a person is a number and they can um, put them wherever they want and they will be productive, like like a like a cog in a um, in a machine. Uh, but it turns out those people have feelings and those people have ambition. And if you don't reason with them, uh, they will go away and everybody loses. Mm. I totally agree. I, I think retaining uh, your staff and allowing them to progress into security or other areas, right, is super important. Because like you said, they're just going to leave at the end of the day uh, if they don't feel that sense of accomplishment uh, and worthiness within the company. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, have a, I have a very good example with a, with a guy that I um, that was working on a help desk, uh, I think it was 20, 2006 or 2007, and he was super, super unhappy there, right? So he, he was looking for uh, other work, and he's like, I really love this company, but I don't feel there is a way for me to grow, uh, grow there. Uh, so I got him in touch with, an, with another company, uh, and he left the company that I worked at. Uh, well, I understood that we needed him, uh, but it was just, he was going to leave anyway. So it's better to have him leave happy and, and help him in that than um, to make him unhappy. And 10 years later, uh, I find him again at another client uh, and the relationship is super awesome and we're, we're doing awesome stuff together. So that's, it's that, that, that interpersonal relationship that I think is ignored a lot because people are dealt with as uh, as numbers and and uh, and pawns rather than uh the the real thinking people they are so when how do you help employees with this kind of learning curve right now let's say if you have a security champions program all right there's a formal process to do that but for organizations that don't where do where should employees go to get some of the training and knowledge and things that they want to give them the ability to to make that shift, right? You know, you were talking help desk, we're talking IT. Where are some of the resources people should look into to, to kind of help them on that journey over to getting more security skill sets? Um, so there, there is one blog post uh, by, I think his Twitter account is DA underscore 667 that has such an amount of, uh, of security uh, links, free, free security training. Uh, that I would always send to uh, to anybody, uh, right? And then from uh, from there, within your company, it's about building those relationships. What, what I often do with people uh, when they start talking to me about I want to go into security or I, I want to change my uh, my, my career um, is give them the tools to negotiate with their uh, manager. A lot of people are very hesitant. Um, we obviously know that a lot of people underestimate themselves. Um, but what, what, what is one of the biggest thing, things you don't like about a manager? That's a long list. <laughs> <laughs> for, for, me, for me, the number one is not giving an answer, right? Yeah, oh, that's true. So um, a lot of people go to their manager and they're like, can I go to DEF CON? Or can I go to this conference? Or can I do this training? And then a the manager doesn't reply because that's the easiest uh, solution for a manager. Then uh, you ask again and they're like, oh, um, I'm waiting for approval of my manager. Uh, and then the price has gone up because the early bird has mm -hmm. already uh, expired. Uh, and they're like, oh, it's above the budget now. Or the, the fun thing, you need approval from your colleagues. That's, uh, that's really? a fun one as well. Uh, <laughs> you, you've never heard of that before? No, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, I want to go to DEF CON and then um, there's obviously uh, the new dad on your team. Uh, there's somebody that's building their house and they, they can all not go to, to DEF CON and they feel like you can't go either. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's it, terrible. Yeah. Um, so what, what I tell, tell people is don't ask questions. Inform your manager of, this, uh, of decisions. And then it's their choice to tell them you can't do that. Oh, so right. don't ask for permission. Ask for forgiveness. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're, you're not going to get the I, answer I, anyway, so. Uh, that's true. I've tried that in my career. It's worked a few times. A few it's times, also backfired yeah. a couple of times. Right. <laughs> uh, I, well, I you think take the, you take the else. <laughs> I think with, with training and conferences, though, with respect to building uh, an InfoSec team, that uh, the number one thing for me 
in that whole dynamic of who gets to go, who doesn't, to which conference, to which training, is whoever goes, come back and share what they've learned with the team, right? Because that's showing the value to the team, showing the value to the business. Executives see that, uh, and the whole company sees that when someone goes to a conference, we bring back that knowledge. You have a lunch and learn with people outside of security, right? And really proves the, the value. Uh, yes, but one, one thing, and I think I segue into another uh, topic that I um, sent, sent to you as well, is uh, focus on training your teams. Um, there, there's a lot of uh, training programs where uh, people get the same trainings over time. So it feels like uh, companies are, uh, are building carbon copies mm. of, uh, of a certain profile that they think is valuable to their security. Uh, the most awesome trainings that I've done, and for instance, I've, I've trained a three team in uh, Algeria, where I came in, um, the, the team was already um, highly skilled. Um, we did a penetration testing course. Uh, I did an incident response course there as well. Uh, and, and just seeing the dynamics between, it, uh, between the team being strengthened, um, even even if the content is not aligned with the knowledge level of all the, all the, all the participants, just being able to identify oh this person is very good at reporting and this person is very good at uh, memory analysis. So why don't we let this person do the memory analysis and then give his information to the person that is awesome at reporting to make sure that it gets reported to executives, right? Mm-hmm. Um, not everybody needs to be the same, and we have to be honest. Um, I, I'll I'll be honest for myself. I'm not an expert in uh, in everything either. Is if somebody asks me a crypto question, I'll probably have to go and look some, some stuff up. Uh, and that's the way it is. The same for diff- different architectures or uh, DLP. I'm, I'm going to have to look stuff up. I'm, I'm not an expert in everything. I'm, I'm, I'm good at what I do. But most of what I do well is uh, the inter- interpersonal relationship and understanding what people's goals are. Uh, and then I fill that technical uh, stuff in. So training, training your teams instead of having your people collect the same uh, the same badges or the cer- same certifications mm. is crucial crucial to success. Yeah, I love that diversification of your training because I think so many organizations look at training similar to compliance in the wrong way where they're just checking the box. Like, oh, we brought in XYZ company and those materials are available to our team. I can check the box for training for my team. Everyone's happy and we move forward. But like you said, Wim, everyone's getting the same, the same training. It, it, it has to be diversified. But, but yeah. we also do it to ourselves, I think, a little bit, Wim, too, is when we post a job description, we want these certifications. We yeah. want a CISSP with, you know, X years of experience. And so these programs are set up so people can get their certifications so they can apply for these jobs. So we do it to ourselves mm. sometimes as, as hiring managers. Uh, yes. So uh, I... I don't think I'm breaching any NDAs here, and if that uh, if that is the case, then that's totally on me. Uh, but I I joined um, IC Squared on the board in 2012, and I think in 2013 the CEO started uh, doing a lot of uh, press and blog posts and stuff like that, uh, making sure to um, to put out the point that certifications are not the the end all be all of uh, professionalism. Um, you have to you, you have to hire for uh, potential and for competence, uh, and not just for certifications. The the hardest thing uh, we saw when I was uh, on on the board and the, the struggle that I saw that the CEO uh, and the subsequent CEOs uh, had uh, was building that relationship with the HR world uh, because the HR world is uh, mostly about about those che- check boxes. Mm. Uh, that's where the challenge is. If if you see security professionals hiring security professionals. Uh, if you look at what, for instance, Daniel Kerber doing, uh, Daniel Kerbert is doing at uh, Santander, or the team that uh, Christopher Hoff has uh, built at uh, Bank of America, right? They're they're looking at people, they're looking at skills, they're looking at potential, uh, and they're these really great empathic leaders, and that's that's what you need to build a team, and not uh, not somebody that checks boxes and looks at certifications. When, for those out there, what, what are some of the um, things you look for in a candidate in terms of aptitude when you're hiring into security? Um, that's, a, that's a very tricky question um, <laughs> because the, the default answer there is passion, uh, and I hate passion with a passion. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, 
I agree. It's like the default um, answer. Oh, I'm really passionate, right? You see that in Shark Tank. Oh, I'm really passionate about my, my business. Well, everyone who has a business should be passionate, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely looking for um, a base IT knowledge uh, and not just uh, understanding Windows and, uh, and Windows desktop management, uh, but a, a little bit deeper um, on, on the network side as well. I, I, see, I see a lot of uh, security professionals out there um, without a thorough uh, network, uh, network knowledge. So that's definitely uh, something I'm digging deep in. The, the main point is uh, curiosity. Not, and that, that shows itself mostly uh, by when a problem occurs. Um, are you gonna are you gonna go go look for pointers and then find a solution yourself, or are you gonna stop in your tracks, um, ask a question and wait until somebody else solves mm-hmm. somebody else so, solves the problem for you? So that I, I don't I don't know if that's uh, exactly curiosity, but uh, perseverance, being being able to to navigate uncharted territory territory by yourself. Yeah, I totally agree, right? It's one of those uh, characteristics I've identified of what we deem as a hacker, right? In trying to define that term. And that's one of the characteristics I kept coming back to in my research and just experience in the past 20 years in the hacker community is (coughs) hackers and security people tend to be those folks that are like, I came up against some technology I had no idea what it was, so I went out and learned it, right? And a lot of those are acquiring skills outside of security. Uh, You know, like we've done interviews with folks that have analyzed voice assistants. And when he was talking, I'm like, so did you get a degree in like, you know, speech and and hearing and and audiology? He's like, no, I just read a bunch of books and then applied it to (laughs) my project. I'm like, that's a great example, right, of the skills that we look for uh, in security professionals. Yeah. That yeah. That, that that that's basically what I uh, what I started uh, Wire Security on is uh, we want to address those wicked problems. We we might not know what we started start on, right? Uh, but we'll make damn sure that we find a solution. Yep. Yeah, Matt. My last trip, my last flight um, since we we all went to work from home, I was covering the C three Cyber Challenge down in Orlando, and it's a high school. Um, capture the flag event. It was interesting because the students weren't that interested in like the networking stuff and some of the other core disciplines. And I said, but you guys have to understand this is foundational stuff that'll help you understand how to traverse networks and hide in network traffic and do that. Like there's, it's so fundamental. And sometimes in in what we see is everybody goes after the the shiny stuff in security or after the pen testing and after Mm -hmm. the tools, but they don't understand some of those un, you know, those foundational layers. And I tried to instill to these students, I'm like, no, that skill set's important. And so I'm glad you brought that up, Wim, is that having some of that IT networking knowledge is something that is valuable when you're looking for uh, people in a security role. Right. Uh, I, th- this may be a funny anecdote, but uh, I remember being at a client, uh, basically building the security program, uh, and I was at uh, at one desk, and the security, uh, no, the the network administration team was uh, at uh, a few desks uh, away from me, and there was a network or outage. Right. They started sending emails to their Gmail address to see if it arrives to troubleshoot the network problem. I mean, that's the the level of hmm. skill that we're dealing with. Hmm. It's interesting. Security can come in and help out in those situations. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Provided we have that, you know, we have to have that underlying knowledge. Uh, completely agree. Right. When uh, training, we were talking earlier about training resources. I know we we touched on it, but. What are the really good training resources? I feel like, especially now, um, that many of us have been forced to work from home, many conferences and other things are going virtual, the amount of training and seminars and webcasts and things that are available, I feel like is more than quadrupled uh, in the past couple of months. Uh, how, do we, yeah. how do we navigate and how do we recommend others navigate when they're at various stages of their career? Okay, that's a that, that that's a very good question. Um, now, I'm I'm not a huge fan of um, the virtual conferences, um, and I, I can see that people find find value in it, and there is definitely a lot of value in knowledge sharing. 
uh, but I feel it's a st substitute for something else that I don't really appreciate about the whole uh, conference uh, sphere. Without getting too negative, because I know I'm not as old as Jack Daniel, but I'm <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there, and the and the snark level often is uh, is pretty high. Um, <laughs> When, when, when I think about training resources, um, am I allowed to um, name brands? Yeah, sure. Or absolutely. So um, one one that I've really started to uh, appreciate is uh, a cloud guru. Mm -hmm. um, so they they provide training on AWS, uh, GCP, um, Azure. Um, I've seen uh, Microsoft put a lot of um, Azure security training and Sentinel training uh, out as well. Uh, that is super interesting. Um, let me think what, what else I've uh, seen that I that I really liked. Um, obviously, if you're uh, into hardware and ARM, uh, all the stuff that um, Azuria is putting out for free is uh, super awesome as well. All the stuff um, that probably everybody knows by um, Corlan um, yeah. is so something you can uh, lose yourself in. But there, 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 there's so much stuff um, I... I, I often try to listen uh, to what people are really um, interested in, what, what what they want to hook into. Yeah, because there's so so many there's little so many. Um, nooks and nooks and crannies in security that um, you can hook into like one topic and it becomes um, a, ra a rabbit hole that you dive into and uh, you'll probably never get out of. Well, what about C yeah, like uh, CTF threat hunting? Yeah. <laughs> what about CTFs? Mm -hmm. I've noticed this kind of like proliferation of of CTFs, uh, and now I've all, I'm also seeing communities built around uh, going out and trying out all these different CTFs and, and collaborating. I don't think it's a bad thing, but there is a vast number of CTFs out there. Or, or is, is there value in those? In your opinion, Wim? Um, there. There, there is value in everything um, you do, as long as you're um, not on your phone, uh, liking pictures on uh, on Instagram or um, checking out uh, small small movies on uh, on TikTok. Yeah, I tell my uh, son that all the time. <laughs> you're 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 improving yourself, or you're sharpening your knives, right? Mm. Uh, and in in that is value. That there, there there is no doubt about that. I think um, if you are on a certain level, and let, let me track back a little bit uh, where I probably maybe have a problem with is that I see the conference world uh, and, and the whole thing about belonging to a community by being present uh, and be, being there um, as that, that's something I see as highly pro problematic because being at a conference or presenting at a, at a conference becomes a goal. Um, and I don't think that's, that, that's how it needs to be. I, I've often described conferences as um, corporate uh, escapism, where we, we get stressed. Uh, and there, there are different reasons why you, why, why you want to run away from stuff, right? Uh, we are not understood. We are stressed. Um, I, I, don't, I don't feel valued. Um, I don't like what I'm doing right now. And I can go to Vegas for a week uh, mm -hmm. and be among my friends. Or I can do, go to this and this and this B-sites and, um, and not have to think about work. Uh, and work obviously val values you um, and wants you to be happy and they feel that this is what uh, what makes you happy and maybe you get some knowledge from that as well. Uh, but it's, it's, it's become more about getting away from what we are responsible for than, um, than the actual learning part. And I see that in, in that CDF, CDF community uh, maybe a little bit as well. Yeah, I'm probably going to get a lot of shit on Twitter for this. No, no, but but I agree. I I think you you have to have goals. There's certainly a social aspect to conferences, right? But the real reason we're there is to learn and help us accomplish our own goals, whether those uh, are aligned very much with your daily work um, or aligned with your career and what you want to learn, right? If your goal is I just want to go to conferences because it gets me out of the office. That, that's not productive for anyone. It's not productive for your employer, and it's not productive for you to advance your, your career goals and your, your skills and knowledge. No, I agree. Yeah. And, well, and we've seen some of these conferences turn into more kind of biz dev uh, vendor events than they are yep. true learning events. And, and when you lose that learning aspect, I think you will lose aspects of the security community attending those events. Then what's just going to be left is a bunch of vendors talking to each other, yeah. which is not good. No, I, yeah.
I've, I've learned to know like uh, people that are very new into security, right? They turn up at a, at a conference and they save a lot of money to, to, to get there. Uh, and they got that first taste of being part of that community. And then there's a rap rapid succession of other people also attending conferences that you can obviously not go to, not, not only because maybe you cannot afford them, but also because um, you, you have work to do, you have, you have money to earn. Uh, and then they, they feel less and less, uh, and they, dis they start to disconnect from that community. Uh, and that's something that's very dangerous. That's how we actually lose people. Mm -hmm. By making it so important to, to be there, um, it, it drives people away. Mm -hmm. No, those, I, those things come at, come, come at a cost, right? Yeah, a, 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 you're right. It needs to be a, a goal for everyone uh, in the community to, to learn, right? Otherwise, yeah. people are just showing up for the sake of showing up or just, you know, eating up a ticket. And as we know, I mean, there's events out there that it's super hard to get a ticket. <clears throat> yeah, that, that's why I like, um, while, while, while we're at the topic, uh, for instance, 44Con in, um, in London. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if they're happening uh, this year or they, they've uh, actually make, made the decision. I'm not sure. Uh, but for the past two years, um, I've been working with uh, Steve Lord, who's the organizer, um, to support him in setting up uh, what he calls uh, assistance tickets. So they have a, um, a set of tickets that are uh, paid for by sponsors like, uh, like myself that um, allow people that, are, um, that can't afford to go to a conference to actually... Um, uh, come out so that 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 are the kind of initiatives that i i want more com uh, conferences uh, doing mm. and not just by uh, for instance black hat giving away the black batches like having a program that actually uh, assesses why people can't go uh, and and find a, a customized solution for that person because there, there there may be someone that really wants to go and see a specific talk because it's relevant for what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis but they can't go for uh, for two days and you can find a custom solution for that uh, and then have another person uh, use the, use the second day mm. uh, instead of just giving a back batch and uh, then right. having somebody come to Vegas and, and party all day um, I'm not I'm not saying that everybody does that but there's a risk uh, to doing that I think if we want to uh, get more and more people and uh, also disadvantaged people into into security uh, we we owe it that we invest our time in in helping them as well not just throwing money at them and and, and tell them to to find their own way but right. actually be there and and support them and have guidance agreed wim thank you so much for appearing on enterprise security weekly it was wonderful having you it's always fun and uh with that we'll conclude the show for today thank you everyone for listening and watching we'll see you next time on enterprise security weekly